Okay, welcome everyone. We're here with Lance Hosey. He's design principal and chief impact officer with HMC Architects. Lance, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks. So Lance, first off, I want to get into your one of your two titles, chief impact officer. I've seen that title used in other industries. What does it mean in the AEC marketplace to you? Yeah, great question. So as you mentioned, I have a dual role as a design principal on projects, but the strategic role, chief impact officer, um, is essentially this, that HMC's mission is to have a positive impact in every way possible. Uh, we were founded in 1940 uh, around the idea of serving communities. Um, the H in, um, in HMC is J. Dewey Harnish, and he founded the firm around the idea that returning veterans from World War II would need new healthcare services, they and their families. So it was founded around this idea that of serving communities. So, and I oversee initiatives to make sure that we're actually doing that. So my umbrella includes messaging, sustainability research, and innovation. As you mentioned, uh, I might be the first person in our industry to have this title, but it's become increasingly common in recent years in other industries. And my guess is that it came about because the people who have this title uh, are also the same kinds of people who have been promoting sustainability for years. And I think that the, the idea of impact broadens the concept uh, because the word sustainability has become somewhat challenging. Uh, the original concept, uh, which I, I believe was first introduced in Dana Meadows' book, The Limits of Growth in 1972, was, uh, this might be a direct quote, that uh, creating an equal opportunity for every person to realize her individual human potential, but doing that within the caring capacity of the earth. That book is really about estimating how many of this, there, uh, how many of us there can be on the planet before we overtax the Earth's resources. So this idea of an equal opportunity to fulfill human potential is about as big as it gets. It's as aspirational as you can imagine. But in the last 50 years, the word sustainability, for some reason, has come to be perceived very narrowly as if it's exclusively around resource conservation. So the implication seems to be that uh, sustainability is about sacrifice and not about enriching lives. The word impact just circumvents all of that uh, because it's simpler and easier to understand as applying to virtually everything. Yeah, it's interesting that word impact is so crucial. And in many cases, I mean, do you have a direct line straight to then the, the, the president and CEO? I've, I've read some of that about chief impact officer roles. They kind of are right up there in the C-suite. Similar situation mm -hmm. at HMC? Yeah, I report to Brian Staten, who's our president and CEO, and is a really great guy. You know, Brian. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, independently of uh, coming to HMC recently, um, I just, you know, it's funny, if you look at the way that sustainability has been handled in org charts in different industries over the last 10 or 20 years, generally speaking across every industry, it, it, it had three phases. One, it began at a grassroots level with people who were re relatively junior, but very passionate. And, um, and, and trying to implement strategies, but not necessarily having the leverage or authority to, to integrate it into corporations. The second phase was to recognize that this was a growing and important topic, and it became steered more by sort of middle management, people at the kind of mid-tier firms, of a, how, who were in an interesting position because they have the eye and the ear of the younger folks on staff, but they are also are not in the C-suite, as you say. More recently, it's become more and more important to recognize that sustainability and all the different initiatives we associate with that term, if you conceive it broadly, is as essential to the function of business as any other area of the enterprise, including business development and communications, marketing, uh, what have you. In a design firm, it's uh, you know my interest, which I'm sure we'll touch on today, is is how to integrate uh, sustainability and design and make their standards one and the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you wrote, literally wrote the book on that very idea, which is can, making the connection between sustainability and architecture. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about where you've seen that advancements in that area as far as how people think about sustainability and architecture? Yeah, it's interesting uh, it, that, I mean, if you look at the ideas behind sustainability or more broadly conceived as just positive impact. It is, you know, one, everyone's familiar with the so-called triple bottom line, social, environmental, and economic impact. Uh, there is nothing of value that doesn't touch on one or more of those categories. 
If I ask you what you care about most, you might say friends and family. You just told me about your, your weekend with your family. Those are social values, right? So sustainability is everything, and yet one of the most common things we hear from our peers is my clients don't care about sustainability. Well, if sustainability is everything, your clients don't care about it, then you think your clients don't care about anything. Well, that's not true. Everyone cares about something. The problem occurs when we define it as if it's tangential to the core values of the communities we serve and the clients we serve. So how do we bring it front and center? In a design firm, that's got to be about design. Uh, we tend to think of design as the icing and sustainability as the cake, when really the design should be the cake. There's a stat that I use all the time that 70 to 90% of the eventual impact of a project is determined by the very earliest design decisions. How big it is, where it's located, shape size, uh, massing, fenestration, et cetera. Those are design questions. So there's this perception that higher performance has to mean higher cost. And I believe it's because we, we design things the way we always have, and then we rely on more expensive systems and materials method and methods to bring better performance. We have to spend more money on those systems, to, on smart systems to make up for dumb design, right? So how do we start from the beginning and think that every decision we make as designers is going to help improve the impact? Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, that was the topic of my 2012 book, The Shape of Green, uh, which I believe is the first book to look at the aesthetics of sustainable design. Yeah, it's quite interesting. And I'd love to get your thoughts on COVID-19 as it pertains to, as we talk about costs, and um, we've been hearing and we've reported on the weekly show a few times how engineering firms specifically are look, you know, telling their clients hey, if you want to implement enhanced filtration and some of the other best practices that are being thrown out there to sort of combat COVID-19 and increase infection control in buildings, you might see um, some higher energy bills in the coming months, even years. I mean, what are you seeing as a sustainability expert, high-performance building expert, HMC being a major firm? And what are you guys seeing as far as impact of COVID-19 on sustainability and green building design, um, whether it's positive or negative? Mm -hmm. Well, the positive, starting with the positive, is that uh, I think our industry, like all of society, has learned that we can make a big difference very fast. 2020 is on record, uh, is, is on track to be the largest single drop in carbon emissions on an annual basis on record. And it's largely because people stopped commuting as much, right? There are fewer buildings operating because people have been isolating. So now the reasons for it are tragic, um, pandemic, loss of lives, but it also shows us that we used to talk about climate change as something that was very only a long-term uh, uh, possibility through incremental change. Now we know that overnight we can make a gigantic difference if we focus. So the flip side of it is that, you know, that for our industry, this is arguably the most significant disruption we've ever faced. Uh, it's fundamentally changing how we use buildings and public space, possibly forever. So uh, it's redefining the very nature of our work. Uh, now, we're very quick to jump in to suggest solutions to any crisis, mm -hmm. um, which speaks to our optimism. That's a really beautiful thing about our industry. At the same time, the science around this has evolved so quickly, it's very difficult to stay ahead. At first, the CDC thought the disease wasn't airborne, and now they're saying it might primarily be airborne. Uh, earlier, physical distancing recommendations focused on a six-foot radius. Now, uh, we're hearing that it could be four or five times that, right? How do you stay uh, up with the science, especially when we're not trained in the science? So in times of uncertainty, it's easy to lose sight of the big picture. Uh, for example, one response to the energy crisis in the 1970s was to seal buildings hermetically and reduce the number of air changes inside, which led to a whole generation of buildings with bad indoor air quality. So in trying to use less energy, we essentially invented sick building syndrome. In other words, we were trying to combat climate change uh, by creating a public health crisis. And today we risk, risk the reverse. I mean, there's more and more evidence that uh, COVID uh, was essentially created by climate change because of a reduction in biodiversity that could be creating the conditions for more and more novel viruses to, for this to occur in the future. And yet the solutions we're attempting, as you mentioned, could exacerbate climate change, creating a vicious cycle. So for example, 
it's been estimated that uh, permanently accommodating standard physical distancing recommendations could add an average of about 11% to the square footage of every building because you're getting less, you know, lower density within building occupants. Uh, so my team and I just published a white paper a week or two ago, which you can find on our website, estimating that if every commercial building in America added 11% to its area, the result would be an additional carbon emissions of nearly 100 million metric tons a year the equivalent of an extra 21 million cars or 17 million ho homes. So paper focuses on ways to address the public health crisis while also lowering energy consumption. The point of this is that, you know, the, if, you, if you dig deep uh, uh, the ethic behind sustainability, the fundamental lesson of ecology is that everything is interconnected. So we can't solve one problem without holistically looking at the whole system, right? Lance Hosey, HMC Architects, thanks for your time. Sure, thank you.